So, we now are going to talk about likelihood. Thank you. We're going to introduce likelihood, which is an extremely important and useful concept in statistics. Some of you probably have never heard of it. Some of you have heard of it but don't fully understand of it, it or haven't used it much. And some of you may have seen it before and used it a fair bit. And hopefully everybody will get something from this, even those of you who are fairly familiar with it. I'm going to present it in a way that you likely have not seen it presented before. And it's going to be presented through a very simple example that will build up slowly. Please stop me at any point if you have any questions. The goals in this lecture are to start with a very careful definition of a p-value, which Jonathan has already introduced and told you not to use as much as possible. But we're actually going to use p-values purely to create confidence intervals, so he'll be very happy. We're then going to define likelihood and understand how to define and create p-value based confidence intervals as well as likelihood based confidence intervals. And finally, I want to leave you with an idea of the flexibility and thus utility of maximum likelihood estimation as a method in statistics. This will feed into uh, several more of the lectures over the next few days. Okay, you're in a city of a million people and Imagine you're omniscient, you actually know everything. You know that the city has a true prevalence of HIV of 30%, so exactly 300,000 people are infected. Now, forget that you know that, and you actually want to estimate the prevalence in the city, so you don't know anything. So you just have a million people and you actually want to know what that prevalence is. The probability distribution of the number of positive individuals if you randomly sampled 100 from that population and tested those 100 people for HIV is binomially distributed. Right? The binomial distribution tells you the number of positive outcomes for a given known probability of positive and a given known number of trials. So here we have 100 trials, probability of positive 0.3, probability of negative 0.7, okay? And so you may find this distribution really familiar or not, but this is a distribution that you can read up on the web and use to understand coin flip processes or testing processes. What we're looking at here is the probability of every possible number of outcomes. If we test 100 people for HIV, Zero of them might be positive, one of them might be positive, two, everything from zero to 100 is possible, right? We, it's discrete though, right? We can't have half a person positive or 2.7. So for every possible outcome, we have the probability of that outcome given this truth, which we generally would not know. But if we pretend we know it, we can visualize this distribution, right? So the probability that 30 people test positive is pretty high, but the probability that 29 people test positive is also quite high, so is 28 or 31 or 32, right? Okay, so now let's pretend that we actually did this experiment where we took 100 people and we tested them once, and 28 are positive, right? Could be 28, could be 27, some rare times maybe it'll be as low as 21, but in this instance, and I'm putting the code for how I did this, and you'll work through this in the tutorial, um, in this particular random draw, we got 28 positive. Okay, now, now let's go back to pretending we don't actually know the true prevalence. All we really know is we tested 100 people and 28 were positive. So we don't know the true prevalence, but we can calculate the probability of 28 or a more extreme number of individuals testing positive given I hypothesize prevalence. Okay, what does that mean? Imagine you really want to know that we're talking about a city, maybe Cape Town, and you really want to know the prevalence, and you haven't done this experiment yet, and you're in a room with six people, 
and they all think they know the prevalence based on their expert opinion. And one person says, okay, I think the prevalence is 30%. And they happen to be right, but at the point, this point in time, you don't know that they're right. If they're right, and it really is 30%, which we don't know, we can calculate the probability of getting 28 or 27 or 26 or anything further away from what they think it should be on average, 30, by chance alone, right? So this is the probability of getting 28 or something smaller if it really is 30. And it's also possible that we could get something far from 30 in the other direction, right? They hypothesize 30%, 30 out of 100 is what you would expect, but we could have gotten 32. That's far from 30 in about the same distance, right? It's two above 32. So you could say, well, let's look at the red area that's 28 or below, or 32 or below, and, uh, above, and sum them up. But what we're gonna actually do is 28 or below, and we're gonna multiply that by two. And the reason we do that is because this distribution is asymmetric. And it turns out that 32 and 28 are not equally extremely different from 30, in fact. In this example, it's close, but when we're around here, it gets further off. So to calculate the probability of something as far from 30 as 28, or even further, we take this area, 28 and below, and multiply it by 2, and that's a p-value. So the probability we got something more extremely different from 30% as 28 or more extreme by chance alone is two times that, which is 0.754. It's a high p-value, so we've learned a lot, right? We've learned nothing, right? As Jonathan would say, high p-values are not useful. But what if somebody else in the room said, hold on, it's not 30%. I think it's 15%. Another expert had a different hypothesis. So we could look at how probable we would have gotten 28 if that expert was actually right. And it turns out that if it really was 15%, this is the binomial distribution we'd have, there's a one in a thousand chance we would have gotten 28 or something more extremely different from 15% if this person was right. So we have a low p-value, so we have learned something, right? We think that this person's hypothesis is improbable because it, it would be very unlikely we get something this extremely different by chance alone. Then the third person in the room says, okay, I, I think it's 20%. And once we've collected the data, we can examine their hypothesis and calculate the p-value and so on. 25%, 30%, 35%, 40%. So again, at 40%, we see it's extremely unlikely. We have a, a low p-value again. So, We've got these six experts in the room, and they've all hypothesized a prevalence. Which ones do you think are good hypotheses? Yes? Shanae, um, 20% through 35% because all of them don't have significant p Okay, so... 20% through 35% because none of them had low p-values, so we can't see that they're wrong, whereas the other ones we can. So how did she get to this conclusion? The way hypothesis testing works is if given the hypothesis, the p-value is below some cutoff, then we reject that hypothesis. Our cutoff is usually chosen as alpha equals 0 0.05, right? This is the false positive rate which we set on purpose to say that we're willing to make this mistake 5% of the time where something that's really random noise we say is a real effect. So given this cutoff, we indeed would reject those two hypotheses. Do we know which of the, the experts is right at this point? No, right? We've merely been able to exclude two of their hypotheses once we collected data. Now, we had six experts in this room. We might have, through some bureaucratic nightmare, had a million experts in the room, each of which hypothesized a prevalence from zero to one equally spaced. Okay, let's look at that scenario. 
and let's plot the p-value as a function of the hypothesized prevalence, right? For each hypothesized prevalence, we could calculate the p-value. Hypothetical prevalence from 0 to 1, p-value. It goes up, it peaks, and it goes back down. And anything that is below 0 0.05, we say we reject, right? Because a low p-value means it's very improbable that these hypotheses could have yielded the data we saw. If these were true, the data we saw would only occur very, very rarely, so rarely that we reject those hypotheses. So we're able to reject anything along this red line that is below the cutoff, which gives us a confidence interval from 19.5% to 37.8%. Confidence intervals are defined in a lot of different ways, and it, people often mistakenly say, well, the probability that the parameter is in there is 95%, which is wrong. And those of you who have taken a lot of statistics is pro have probably been told that's wrong. Another common way that they're presented is if you repeated this experiment infinite times, this interval would capture the true value 95% of the time, which is roughly correct. But actually what we're doing in practice is closer to identifying the collection of hypotheses which we cannot reject. So that is another way to think of confidence intervals, the collection of hypotheses we cannot reject. All of these experts made hypotheses and we were not able to reject them at that p-value. And that is our 95% confidence interval. So since we can't reject any of them, it's possible that the true value is in that interval. Any questions? No questions? People with me so far? Okay, so the confidence interval is the collection of null hypotheses we can't reject. The p-value is telling us the probability that we would have seen the data we actually saw or something more extreme given a specific hypothesis. Yes? The data we saw is discrete, right? It's a counting number of people. I'm not exactly sure, but wouldn't we they expect the p-values here to have like some steps in them? Because there would be a group of hypotheses which fit within one, within one category, within one number of people. Well, actually, the hypothesized prevalences are continuous, yeah. right? And if somebody hypothesizes a prevalence of 28% or 28.1%, it does change the probability that you'd see 28. So the p-values will be continuous as you change the hypothesized prevalences continuously, even though the data are discrete. Other questions? Okay. So that's one way we can calculate a confidence interval. There's another way. We did this weird summing up the area under the curve where we were looking at the more extreme range of possibilities or as extreme as what we saw, or more extreme, why not just look at the height of the bar, right? Let's, we have this binomial distribution that is the probability distribution of getting a certain number of people testing positive if the true prevalence is, in this case, 30%, which is just one expert's hypothesis. And we can actually calculate the exact probability that we would have got in 28. We don't have to necessarily look at 28, 27, 26. This is useful information too. The exact probability that 28 would test positive if the true prevalence was 30% is 8%. 8% of the time we test 100 people when the true prevalence is 30%, we're gonna get 28 positive. Okay, so that's, that's useful. Let's see if we can run with this. Questions on this? So the sum of the area under a probability distribution function is one, because we're looking at the probability of each possible outcome, and something has to happen, so it has to sum to be one. 
So the height of each of these bars is the probability of exactly that event happening because this is a discrete ev event space. Only you can't have 28.5 testing positive. So the height of this bar is 0 0.08. So 8% of the times, if you run an experiment where the true prevalence is 30% and you test 100 people, 8% of the time, you'll get 28. Okay, and then you can look, see maybe it's like 8.5% of the time you'll get 29, 8.7% of the time you'll get 30 and so on. And um, you know, 22 you might get 1% of the time, for instance. So that's what this probability distribution is telling us. And now we're looking at just one of those outcomes instead of the outcome we saw and everything more extreme in it. Okay, so let's go back to our room of experts and look at the probability of the data we saw exactly happening for each of their hypotheses. For that first expert who said the prevalence is 30%, the probability we would have gotten 28 out of 100 is 0 0.000353. Very rarely would we get 28 testing positive if they were right, okay? 20%, okay, 1% of the time we would actually get 28 people testing positive. If the true prevalence was actually 25%, then 7% of the time, and so on and so forth, okay? So we have this other metric which is the binomial probability distribution function evaluated at exactly the outcome that we saw. So of these six experts, which of their hypothesized prevalences gives the greatest probability of observing what we saw? Sorry? The 30%, right? Because that's, this is exactly what we're looking at. This is the greatest number, right? So this expert, if they were right, would have had the greatest probability compared to the other experts of us seeing what we saw. Okay, so this is, as, as we notice, we're kind of, I'm being very specific with words here on purpose because we're tr we need to be careful when we're using probabilistic language to make sure we're saying things exactly. But we also don't want to contort our sentences too much, and it's nice to have easier language. So we could have just said, which of these prevalence values is more likely, given our data? And it's the same thing, okay? So we're moving to likelihood. We had these six experts. They all made hypotheses. We don't know which one's right. They could all be right because we don't know the absolute truth, but we've seen some data, and we can now say which of their hypotheses is more likely because we know the probability of getting our data for each of their hypotheses. So this one is the most likely. So now, like we did before, we are gonna jam a million people in our room full of experts, each with their own idea about what the true prevalence is, but each, they, they don't know. These are their ideas. And we're gonna look at the probability of seeing exactly what we saw for each of their hypotheses. And we're, that's the likelihood. The probability of our data given the prevalence, their hypothesized prevalence, is the likelihood. And the likelihood function also goes up and peaks. It's not the same, it, it has a similar shape, it's peaking in the same place, but we create it in a different way, right? Instead of taking the area under the probability distribution that was our observation or something more extreme, we're just looking at the height of the probability distribution at our observation. Now, all of these hypothetical prevalences, as we highlighted with the p-value plot, can be thought of as null hypotheses, right? You're used to thinking of the null hypothesis as no effect or um, you know, risk ratio of one, but it can just be what somebody thinks is true before we have data, and that's how we're using it here. The true unknown value 
is 0.3, right? When we were omniscient, that's what we said was true. The maximum likelihood estimate is the parameter value. The parameter here is the prevalence. The parameter value that gives the greatest probability of our data having occurred. What do you think that is on this plot? Where do you think that peaks? 28, right? 0.28, not 0.3 because our data is 28 out of 100. So even though the truth is really 0.3, our likelihood's going to peak at 0.28. Any questions? OK. So when we did this experiment, we didn't actually know what the true prevalence was. This 0.3 was back when we pretended we were God and we knew everything, but we don't. All we know is that 28 out of 100 is what we saw, and so the, the expert that is going to give us the greatest chance of seeing what we saw is gonna be the one that said, oh, I think 28% is the prevalence, right? Before the experiment, that's what they said, and that's gonna be the expert that has the highest, that is the most likely hypothesis gives the greatest probability of us seeing what we saw. Relatively continuous. What do you mean continuous? The way that the way the estimates are being the estimates are being drawn here. I understand that we don't know the true value and that that is not necessarily in line with it, but Oh, an expert did say 0.3, and they're right there. Okay. Right? So their, their hypothesis was pretty likely, too, but not as likely as the one who said 28%, given all we know is 28 out of 100 were positive, right? So we did have an expert saying that. We had an, an expert saying that 26% was the truth, and they were also a pretty likely hypothesis, but just not as likely as 28%, given our, data. Given, given our data, which is all we know, right? We don't know the truth. Other questions? Okay, so now we have this nice peak thing. With the p-value, we had a pretty nice, clear way of then saying, okay, well, we can draw that line at 0.05, and get a confidence interval. We need different machinery, different methods to do that with this, and that's where we're going. But first, let's, let's define the likelihood really clearly. The likelihood function is a function of parameters. In this case, the prevalence is our parameter of our model. Our model is that there is some rate at which people, or some proportion of people have HIV, and the parameter of that model is the proportion that have HIV. It's a very simple model here. So this vertical line here means given or conditional on. The likelihood function is a function of the parameters conditional on the data that's observed. It equals the probability distribution function, which is a function of the data given a parameter. The difference between the two is what we assume is given. On the left, we assume the data is what's given, and we vary the per parameter. On the right, with the probability distribution function, we say, oh, we know the parameter. What's the probability of all the possible data outcomes? So the math, the, the expression is the same. It's just what we take as given. So the likelihood is not a probability distribution. It's a function that takes probabilities from many different distributions. Every expert of those million experts, we created a probability distribution function for the parameter they gave us, for the prevalence that they gave us. And then we took one single value from their function to calculate the likelihood for that hypothesis, and then we put them all into the likelihood function. So we're taking probabilities from a bunch of different probability distributions, which means the likelihood function does not integrate to one. Probability distribution functions have to integrate to one, but meaning the area 
under them has to be one because if you take the space of all outcomes, something has to happen, so it must integrate to one. The likelihood is not going to do that because it's not defined in a way that's over event space. It's over parameter space. So the probability distribution function for the binomial is a function of x, a function of the possible data outcomes given some parameter, p. The likelihood function is the same thing on the right. The only difference is on the left, we're saying what's the likelihood of a prevalence given the observations we made. And I could have put n, I could have put x and n because n is kind of part of our data too. How many people did we actually sample? Questions? Okay, so we have this likelihood function and we want to maximize it to find that peak. This is an example where we basically could just guess the peak like Sinead did. We know that it's going to peak at the proportion that we're positive, 0.28. But in many complicated instances, we don't know what parameter maximizes the likelihood just by guessing. So how can we do that? We have this function as a function of p given x and n, and we want to maximize it. How would you maximize a function? Mathematicians in the room. You take the derivative and set it to 0, and then solve for p. So let's do that. Okay. Oh, well, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we often, for historical reasons, don't think about the likelihood. We think about the log likelihood. And one of the reasons is that over here we have a bunch of products. Now when you take the log of a bunch of products, you get what? A bunch of sums. And we like easier math, so we're going to work with sums. So we take the log. and then. Well, so that's not really historical reasons. That's for ease of calculation. For historical reasons, we often work with the negative log likelihood, so we minimize it instead of maximizing it. If you ever see negative log likelihood, don't let the negative confuse you. It's the same to minimize the negative log likelihood as it is to maximize the log likelihood as it is to maximize the likelihood. Okay? It's just historical reasons plus ease of math. Okay, but if we find the bottom of this valley, we found the peak of that curve. Okay, so now we're going to, now that we've got the negative log likelihood function, we're going to take the derivative and set it to be zero. So when we apply rules from calculus, or sorry, before we, we apply rules from calculus, let's take the products and turn them into sums, right? That's why we did this in the first place. So we can separate these three factors out this way. And we also know that we can bring the exponents down, right? Those might be familiar log rules for some of you. The log p to the x is equal to x times log p, right? So we're making the math easier for ourselves. So that same expression, let's work from there. We're now going to set that, the derivative of that to equal 0. So what's the derivative of log n choose x with respect to p? 0, right? If you take the, log, or if you take the derivative of something with respect to p and it doesn't have a p in it, then it, it just disappears. So we get 0. The derivative of this is x over p. The derivative of this is negative n minus x over 1 minus p. If this isn't super familiar because it's been a few years since calculus, don't worry, but take my word for it, this is uh, <laughs> how you do the derivative. And we, so now that we've set the derivative to equal zero, I'm going to put hats on top of the p's to indicate that we're estimating something. p is now the maximum likelihood estimate, so that's what hats usually mean, it's an estimate of something. And we have this set equal to zero, so we're going to cross multiply by the two denominators. And then we can ignore the denominator, right, because it equals zero. And then we get zero equals minus x plus p hat x plus p hat n minus p hat x. Those two cancel out, so we get zero equals negative x plus p hat n. p hat equals x over n. 28 over 100. 
So we just derived the maximum likelihood estimate by setting the likelihood function's derivative to zero, right? So likelihood, great, it works. It's giving us something that makes sense for this very simple example. Yes? Yeah, so, so if this whole thing equals zero, then whenever the numerator equals zero, this whole thing will equal zero. So we can just ignore the denominator, right? All we really need to know is when the numerator equals zero, because that will make this whole thing equal zero. Zero over four equals zero, zero over nine equals zero, zero over two equals zero. Or the mathematicians would just say you multiply both sides. Yeah, or you multiply both sides by the denominator. More, more clear, thank you. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> okay, so, I, and I don't want anybody to get bogged down in this math. If you didn't follow the math, the concepts should still be clear. We can maximize this function using some math, and it's giving us what we think it should for p hat our estimate of the proportion positive. Okay, so we have this function. We now know p hat is 0.28, and we also know the bottom of this valley is 0.28. Okay, now we're, we want confidence intervals. We don't just want to know the best estimate itself. So to do that, we're going to use the likelihood ratio test, which some of you might have heard before. And the way this test works is it considers the ratio of two likelihoods. And based on that ratio, is it gives us the ability to say whether they are significantly different. So all of our experts had these null hypotheses, these hypothetical prevalences. We have an alternative hypothesis now that 28% is the truth. Right? And that 28% we got by fitting some data. We had more flexibility than these experts who just said something and they had no flexibility. When we have more flexibility by fitting some data, we're always gonna have a, a better likelihood, right? They didn't have the ability to push their value to the peak, whereas we did that. So this likelihood ratio should be greater than one, right? For everybody, right? If we're at the peak, they're all gonna be below us, right? So the maximum likelihood estimate is going to have a likelihood that's higher than all the other likelihoods. And what we want to do is to say for all those other likelihoods, how different are they? And we're going to take the ratio to say how different they are. And it turns out that there's some statistical theory that says two times the log likelihood ratio has a probability distribution itself, which is the chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the difference in flexibility between the numerator and the denominator. Here, we fitted to one data point. So we have, we have one extra parameter that we're allowed to use, which gives degrees of freedom equal to one. And if that wasn't crystal clear, don't worry about it. This is something that we use as machinery, but isn't necessarily important that you understand the theory of why it has this distribution. This is the chi-square distribution. And so we're saying that this log likelihood ratio, um, sorry, negative, and I reversed the numerator and the denominator, so it could say this, these are the same, has this distribution. And if we're just fitting noise, it has this distribution. So if the true prevalence is 30% and we estimated 28% and we're talking to that expert who said 30%, who is right? Who actually knows the truth? Us who fit the data or the expert who said 30% and guessed it? The expert, right? So the expert guessed the truth, he didn't know that. We fit the data and got 28%, we fit noise, right? So our estimate is actually different from his based on noise. And so the amount of noise and how different they are tells us whether we can reject the experts as being so far different as a null hypothesis that our fit to the data is inconsistent with his hypothesis and we would reject it. 
And so the chi-squared cutoff is in the 5% tail of the distribution here. And so when this ratio is so big that we're in the, dis the tail of the distribution, then we're saying we're not just fitting noise. What we fit to the data is unlikely to just be so different from that expert based on noise. It's actually different from what that expert said because there's some real effect. Okay? So this works because adding parameters, adding flexibility is always going to give us a maximum likelihood estimate that's better than somebody's guess beforehand because we're fitting the data and they're not. And sometimes our fit is much better than theirs and that's when we say we're pretty sure that we're not just fitting noise, that their guess is actually pretty bad. Okay, so that's what's going on here. So again, there's theory behind this and you don't need to understand why it's distributed this way to use it. But you can do some of the math here to get a pretty useful way to see how this is used in practice. So again, we're doing logarithm rules here. We're saying the alternative hypothesis is our maximum likelihood estimate. This is each expert's guess. And I'm gonna, instead of write it as log likelihood, use little l to mean log likelihood just in one go. And the value right here that gives 5% of the area in the tail of the chi-square distribution is 3.84, right there. So when negative two, the log likelihood of the maximum likelihood estimate, plus two times the log likelihood of an expert's guess is greater than 3.84, we reject that expert's guess as not being just possibly consistent with our data based on noise. It's too far away to be consistent based on noise. And if we divide by two, we see that basically when the log likelihoods are more than 1.92 away, we can reject that proposed hypothesis. Okay, so we said we know 0.28 is the maximum likelihood estimate. We're gonna look at it on the negative log likelihood plot. Let's zoom in. We're down there, and now we just draw a line that is 1.92 above the maximum likelihood estimate, and we get our confidence interval. And this is how you create confidence intervals with likelihood. Different than p-values, but we can compare the confidence intervals. They're very close, right? They both make some assumptions. This one has a little bit of an approximation in it that's true for for large sample sizes, but does pretty well all the time. So they're both valid methods, but they're different ways of thinking about the problem that we get to make confidence intervals. And again, in either way, we're thinking about it the same way for a confidence interval. It's a collection of null hypotheses or proposed guesses that we cannot reject. In either case, we can reject everything out here. Questions? Yes. Uh, um, so the likelihood ratio of the cutoffs, the confidence interval, is independent of the underlying probability distribution, right? Is it independent of what? The underlying probability distribution that you're assuming. Yes. So it's based on the chi-squared distribution. But if you're fitting a model that has five free parameters and comparing it to a model with no free parameters, then the, it's the chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom equal to five. Did, did you have another question? Sorry. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Are there parallels with the likelihood ratio test um, used for maximum likelihood estimation to the likelihood ratio you use for diagnostics, what we did earlier today? Uh, like like the, the predictive value of the positive? Or are using likelihood ratios like the probability of leading disease positive even? test positive. Um, so what are you, like so in that case you're trying to estimate what exactly? So they use the likelihood ratio of clinical, um, at 
be to, to tell you the probability that you have a disease if you test positive, like what we did in John's lecture today, and they call it a likelihood ratio. Um, I'll, I'll have to get back yeah. to you on that. I'm not quite following it yet. Sure. Uh, other questions? I, I, the short answer is it's the likelihood ratio test. Um, the long answer is I, I guess I don't know the specifics of, of the scenario you're talking about, but the likelihood ratio test is used all over the place. It's used in regressions um, to figure out whether a uh, regression coefficient is statistically significant. It's used to compare models. It's used in a lot of things. Yes? Um, this might be a little tangential, but if, so you use like the ratio test for confidence intervals, so, um, which is based on the chi-square distribution, right? So when we say like in a linear regression, like the errors are normally distributed, is that, so is, is that related to like confidence intervals, or is that to residuals? So in a regression, a Gaussian regression, you're assuming that the errors are normally distributed. Here, the likelihood ratio test is based on a normal approximation itself, which is the, the chi-square distribution is the square of um, the Gaussian distribution, the normal distribution. So the, it also has some normal approximation in it, but you can use it for all sorts of probability distributions. It's not restricted to that. Yes? And then, um, what would happen if for example, had a strangely low number of HIV people out of that 100, so say for example, how would we use the conflict in the whole approach? So you're saying it's actually 30%, but we happen to get 20? So all we know is 20, right? So our, our confidence interval is going to be set, centered on 20%, and it's going to have a range around there, and it's not going to be affected by the truth. All it can be affected by is 30%. If we draw 20 out of 100 positive and the truth is 30%, or if we draw 20 out of 100 positive and the truth is 20%, the confidence interval should be the same because we don't actually get to know the truth. Mm. So how do we get closer to knowing the truth? By collecting more data. So if we did, if the truth was 30% and we sample 100 people and 20 test positive, that, and that it, you know, happens one in a thousand times. If we do it again, it's probably not going to happen again, right? So maybe the next time we get 32 and we say, oh, it's surprising how different they are, let's do it again, then we get Again, 28, and so we see, oh, okay. So as you get a larger sample size, the confidence intervals start to shrink, and you're more certain that your noise isn't overly affecting your data, your estimates. Good question. Okay, yes? Um, I'm trying to get some the degrees of data. Like, I understand that in comparing two models, it can take the degree of this case, and the difference to parameters between the but in this scenario, is the degrees of freedom based on the 28 we're estimating? The degrees of, yes. So, so it's, the 28, the one that's coming in and the one that's estimating. Exactly. It's, it's exactly that. Because the experts didn't get to use that. Okay. Right? But we did. So that's our degree of freedom. That's our extra bit of flexibility that they didn't have. Exactly right. Other questions? Okay. So we, we can calculate confidence intervals with p-values, and that may, at least in some ways, have seemed more straightforward, maybe in other ways less straightforward. Why is likelihood so important? It's very practical in a very wide variety of statistics. You can estimate parameters. We can use it to get the variance of parameters, like getting the confidence intervals. And it's easily adaptable to different probability distributions and also to complicated models like hierarchical regression models, mixed effects models, or the types of dynamical models we've been talking about here. What we need is a probability distribution that takes us from parameters to our data. 
And once we have that, we can calculate a likelihood, right? Because it's the same thing. It's just reversing what we're taking as given. We're taking the data as given and trying to have, see how likely different parameters are. So as long as we can specify a probability distribution function of our data, we can calculate a likelihood and try to maximize it. With the p-value thing, we have to sum up the area under curves, which summing up the area under curves can be very tricky for very complicated probability distribution functions, especially when we have more than one parameter and there's more than one dimension that we're trying to get the area or volume underneath. So likelihood's easier, right? It's easier to just get the height of one bar than to get the height of all these bars. So that's one of the reasons it's, it's more practical. We can also use it to, when we're fitting models that have multiple parameters we're fitting, we can profile one parameter and say, for all the possible values of that parameter, for all the possible values of prevalence, for instance, let's get the best fit of this model with all the other parameters flexible. Which basically says, given everything else we're doing to try to fit this model to the data, what's the best fit for this specific parameter? And so we can get confidence intervals on one parameter across all the variation in the other parameters, which may be useful if that's the parameter we're really interested in. So those are called profile likelihood confidence intervals, and uh, that's in one of the tutorials. Okay, in summary, p-values use cumulative probabilities from probability distribution functions. Cumulative means we're looking at accumulation, right? That whole area, that swath of outcomes that was as extreme or more extreme than the data. Likelihood is conditional on the data and looking at the height of a bar, the probability of our data, but from different probability distribution functions, right? Every expert had their own probability distribution function. We're varying the parameters in a likelihood function. We're not varying the data. Probability distribution functions, we say, well, what are all the different data possibilities that could happen? Here, we know the data. We want to know how likely the different parameters are. Confidence intervals are collections of non-rejectable hypotheses. It's probably one of the more solid confidence interval definitions out there. Um, so the 95% of the times you do this experiment, you'll capture the true value is a good one too, but this one is more operationally accurate, what we're actually doing. Maximum likelihood estimation methods use likelihood ratio tests to get at confidence intervals. That's the most common way to do it. Any questions? <laughs>